What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Welcome back to the Illumination Hour for week number eight. Can you believe that? It's already been eight wonderful weeks of sitting down and recording by myself and and sending out whatever message I have to you. Well, I hope it's received well, um, but I'm not really sure. I haven't gotten any feedback so much yet, although occasionally I'll check and see how many listens and downloads I have and that kind of keeps me going at least I know that uh, somebody is listening out there because each time I put out an episode there's numerous plays so that's that's always encouraging to hear I would really like to get some listener emails however so if you have any comments or questions or even if you just want to tell me what you think of the, these recordings that I make every week, send me a message at illuminationhour at gmail.com because I always love hearing from you. You know, this the show isn't just about my indulgences. <laughs> it's also about yours. Um, uh, that's why you listen, isn't it? Because you're indulging some sort of interest of yours. And that's that's part of the reason why I do this. It's not only so that I can indulge myself when I feel like I'm fascinated by something. It's also because I kind of want to spread this message or this knowledge out to you. And I I guess I haven't really been as precise in spreading that message as I could have been because, you know, lately I've been I've been talking about sciencey things and not really explaining why I've been talking about them because you know I've I've done quite a few recorded shows in the past and each time I've done a a podcast or a radio show it's always been something that is either political or philosophical and I really do enjoy talking about those things but it's kind of difficult to talk about by yourself um also i feel like there's not really an answer to politics you know it's it's not going to lead us anywhere really anyway i i've been talking about science and and life on other planets and life here on earth uh because it's something that i'm fascinated by uh but why not talk about something else like news why not news is hip it's happening it's interesting, to say the least. I mean, it keeps us up to date on our world, right? Like, what's going on around us. But often i found that news, especially when it's coming from a large corporation like Fox, CNN, Huffington Post, uh, things like that, they like to put out these passing stories that have really bright, flashy headlines that will grab your attention and make you instantly interested. Uh, they want to make you feel something. They want to evoke some sort of emotion. And that's what keeps people tuning in or reading or listening. Because emotions are kind of addicting. Especially when they're ones that confirm what you already believe. You know, that confirmation bias that we all have. Uh, but often these stories are... they're brief in their existence in our minds they pass very quickly they're not something that's lasting or impactful on occasion they are occasionally we hear stories especially stories that make us feel fearful i find that news corporations really like to talk about things that 
frighten us and make us scared because I don't know, it spread some sort of agenda. But for the most part, it doesn't really change our lives. It's not impactful to our existence for the most part. It does instill fear and catch our attention and give us something to talk about. But I don't think that it's going to give us any sort of grand realization of life around us. Take, for example, this news story that's on the front page of Fox News. I mean, it was published on July 23rd. Okay, so it's on the front news. The headline says, Police hunt for motive in Munich shooting that killed nine. That sounds really cryptic. They're searching for a motive for a mass murder. But this happened in Munich in Europe. I guess Fox News isn't specifically American, but it does seem to be that way for the most part. Okay, I'll read the story briefly, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Police were hunting Saturday for clues to explain why an 18-year-old German-Iranian man opened fire at a crowded Munich shopping mall and fast food restaurant, killing nine people and wounding at least 16 others before killing himself. Munich police chief Hubertus André said, No evidence of links to the Islamic State group has been found in the home and room of the suspect. Wow, so they searched his home and his room for anything that might link him to a terrorist organization. Andre also told a news conference that the crime and the perpetrator had absolutely no link to the issue of refugees. Well, that's good. I mean, at least they're not making up stories about how he was a refugee so that we can stir up some anger. The attack in the Bavarian capital sparked a massive security operation as authorities already on edge after the recent attacks in Würzburg and Nice, France, received witness reports of multiple shooters carrying rifles shortly before 6 p.m. Six hours later, police declared a cautious all-clear, saying the suspect was among the ten dead and that he likely had acted alone. Peter Beck, a Munich police spokesman, said officers were still collecting evidence at the scene of the crime Saturday morning. With regard to the suspect, we have to examine everything, but we don't know yet what triggered the crime, Beck told the Associated Press. He declined to confirm reports by German Daily Bild that officers had raided a home in the city's Marxvorstadt district about two kilometers from the mall and were interviewing the suspect's father, citing ongoing police operations. Beck said the number of people receiving hospital treatment stood at 16, three of whom were seriously wounded. Security restrictions in the city have been lifted and public transport is operating as normal, Beck said. German Chancellor Angela Merkel was due to chair a meeting of her government's security cabinet Saturday. Then there's a chart below that says fatalities and injuries from terrorist attacks in Germany. Some of fatalities and injuries since 1970 in the country the attack took place in. A terrorist attack is defined as the threatened or actual use of illegal force and violence by a non-state actor to attain a political, economic, religious, or social goal through fear, coercion, or intimidation. Wow. I can't believe they just said that. Let's reread that sentence. See if you hear anything fishy. A terrorist attack is defined as the threatened or actual use of illegal force and violence by a non-state actor to attain a political, economic, religious, or social goal. A non-state actor. So if it was a state actor, it would not be terrorism. But because these terrorists were not hired by the largest gang in the world, a.k.a. the government, it's a terrorist act. But when the government does things like that, oh, it's all right. It's just an act of war, and war is totally fine. Or we were protecting the public. The public is better off because we killed these nine people. Sure, if you, if you put that sort of headline on a story, then of course people are going to be a little saddened. But they'll be totally fine with it. Whereas this story about a terrorist, that is outrageous! Can you believe that some guy had the gall 
to kill those people. If it was a police officer, it would be completely different. And sadly, people still believe that. Okay, well, looking at this graph, in 1990, there were far more terrorist attacks than there were all the way up until 2015. In 2010 to 2015, there's practically none. And then here in 2015, there's a spike because of this one event. It looks like this one event. Maybe there was more. I'm not really sure. But there hasn't been terrorism here in Germany in quite a while. So this one outlying case is probably going to send Germany into a fear spiral, perhaps. Maybe not. Maybe Germans are different than America. Because I know every time this happens in the U.S., people get terrified and they start talking about terrorists around every corner, taking extra precautions, violating our privacy rights just so that we can have some uh, added security. Also, I find it a little disturbing that the police were interrogating the suspect's father and that they had security restrictions placed all over the city. Those, I feel like, are taking it a step too far. The suspect's father likely had no idea about what his son was doing. If he had, then he is likely as crazy as his son, and probably would have joined him. Placing restrictions on the entire city? That's punishing all of the citizens that live in that area for going through something that was dangerous and terrifying to them. Perhaps the city would be safer if all of the citizens were allowed to leave or allowed to go out and hunt down this guy themselves. I'm sure there are many other options besides closing down all transportation across the city. All right, on with the story. At an address in Dacher Strasse that was searched by police early Saturday, a neighbor described the suspect as very quiet. He only ever said hi. His whole body language was of somebody who is very shy, said Stefan, a coffee shop owner who would only give his first name. He never came into the cafe, he added. He was just a neighbor and took out the trash, but never talked. So watch out for shy, quiet people, folks, because they're weird and they might do something that you don't like. You know, I was a shy, quiet person at one point. And sure, I, I made jokes about killing people when I was younger, as all young people do. They think it's kind of funny. They don't realize the seriousness of their jokes. But when you're a grown person and you talk about killing people, that's a little different. But anyway, being shy and quiet, that's nothing to be afraid of. If anything, those people are afraid of you. You just have to get them out of their head. Get them talking. Share their thoughts. You know, maybe they're quiet because they feel like nobody wants them around. If you make them feel welcome, perhaps they won't be so shy. Some 2,300 police from across Germany and neighboring Austria were scrambled in response to the attack, which happened less than a week after a 17-year-old Afghan asylum seeker wounded five people in an axe and knife rampage that started on a regional train near the Bavarian city of Würzburg. The Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the train attack, but authorities have said the teen, who was shot and killed by police, likely acted alone. Do you think it's necessary to shoot and kill these people that go kind of nuts and attack other people? Perhaps nobody could blame you if you kill them in self-defense, but I, I don't think that it's a good idea to just say that we need to kill everyone who begins to act violently. Also, 2,300 police from Germany and Austria? That is a ridiculous amount of reinforcement. Imagine how much money that is costing all the taxpayers. I don't know, maybe they're happy that they have so much state protection. But to be honest, I, I would trust people who have better motivation than the police Andre said early Saturday that the shooting suspect was a dual citizen who had lived in the city for some time and whose motive was still fully unclear. He said it was too early to label the attack an act of terrorism, 
The police had used the term earlier to describe the nature of their operation, which included calling in the elite GSG-9 Special Operations Force. The question of terrorism or a rampage is tied to motive, and we don't know the motive, Andre said. Andre also said the suspect's body was found about two and a half hours after the attack, which started shortly before 6 p.m. at McDonald's restaurant across the street from the mall. The body was determined to be the shooter based on witness statements and closed-circuit television footage of the attack. The man, whose name was not released, was not previously known to police, and there was no evidence of any links to terrorist organizations, Andre said. So perhaps this guy just went nuts. A cell phone video posted online showing the suspect dressed in black standing on a rooftop parking area of the mall, yelling back and forth with the person filming, said at one point, I'm German, and eventually firing shots. Police believe the video is genuine. Well, they better if this guy was being shot at. David Akavan, a 37-year-old from Tehran, Iran, who works at the Shandiz Persian restaurant, described his anguish as he learned of the shooting. I started to get texts from friends asking if I was safe, he said. Then my thoughts were, please don't be a Muslim. Please don't be Middle Eastern. Please don't be Afghani. I don't accept any of this violence. Because this guy knows. If the shooting was done by a person who was from the Middle East or Afghanistan or was a Muslim, this would be turned into a major piece of anti-Muslim, anti-Middle Eastern propaganda. It would just be another tool with which the media could say, hey, here's why we don't like the Middle East. When not everybody from the Middle East is like that. Also, I think it's interesting to point out that this news organization is just gathering interviews from people who kind of surround the story. Like, it's good storytelling, but it's not really investigative in that they're trying to solve the mystery. They're just telling the story in a way that gets you emotionally hooked. Witnesses had reported seeing three men with firearms near the Olympia Einkauf Centrum Mall. But Andre said two other people fled the area, were investigated, but had nothing to do with the incident. Local residents described the scene as the shooting unfolded. I was standing on the balcony smoking a cigarette. Suddenly I heard shots, said Ferdinand Buzorgzad, who lives in a high-rise building next to the Olympic Shopping Center. First I thought someone had thrown some firecrackers. I looked down at the McDonald's and saw someone shooting into the crowd. Then I saw two people lying there. Franco Augustini, another local resident, said his daughter hid in the shopping center during the attack. Next to our flat was a woman who was full of blood, Augustini said. My wife had a bottle of water. Then we helped to wash her. It was horrible and made me speechless. Andre, the police chief, said the nine fatalities included young people. Children were among the 16 wounded, three of whom were in critical condition. Oh, that's horrible. The story's even making me feel sad and sick. Public broadcaster Bayerischer Rundfunk reported that most of those killed were aged 15 to 21 years. A 45-year-old woman was also killed, BR reported, without citing sources. At least three of the victims appeared to be of Kosovo-Albanian origin, according to Facebook posts from family members. Their identities have not been officially confirmed. Munich has large communities of people who fled the Balkan Wars in the 1990s, but like many German cities, has in recent years also become home to a diverse mix of people from many different countries, including Iran. Oh, that finishing statement, including Iran, because those fucking crazy Iranians are going to shoot up every place they go to, right? So do you see what the story is doing? It's framing the story in such a light that you can't help but be on the side of the police and the victims. I mean, obviously nobody should be on the side of the shooter because... 
it's completely wrong in every single way to shoot somebody for no reason. Especially just innocent bystanders who are walking around a mall. I mean, sure, maybe you don't like the the capitalism or the commodization of people's lives, essentially, but that is not grounds to end someone's life. So, of course, the shooter is wrong, but that does not immediately mean that everybody else is right. I don't think that the police are right in just taking over the entire city because of this incident. Also, this story is just... It's making you sad and a little frightened and maybe suspicious of all of those quiet people around you that with the shifty eyes that never stop and talk, they only say hi. I think it's just important to remain skeptical when you read stories like this because hardly ever will you find a news organization that doesn't have an agenda. Also, why are they telling a story like this? Why are they not telling stories about something positive, something that's actually changing the world, something that's impacting people's lives on, in a way that we want to hear about, that we want to see spread. This story is about an isolated incident of a crazy man in Germany, and it doesn't really matter where it is per se, but how relevant is it to us? We always must ask that. After hearing this story, do you feel like you're going to find more terrorism in your life? And how do you define terrorism? Is it just somebody who starts shooting? Do they, does that mean they have an agenda? Maybe they just went schizophrenic or had a manic episode. That doesn't mean that they're terrorists or they have some sort of motivation to, to change your mind about something. They're just insane people. It is a possibility. But you see, even I'm calling it terrorism now after reading that story, and we don't even know that it is. It most likely is not. Somehow I feel that this story is kind of a distraction from the more important things in our lives. Yes, it's scary. Yes, I want it to stop. But am I going to change the way I behave on a daily basis just because a story like this comes out? No. Does it change my beliefs? No. I'm still the same person after reading that story. Perhaps just more of a, a sad person. That's why I don't like reading the news, because it just fills me with fear, loathing, sadness, anger. These are not good emotions. They don't progress my life in a positive direction. And I don't see how it benefits anybody to read these stories. It's not like you're learning about something that you can use to advance your life. You're just learning about a story. Eventually, though this story is on the front page of Fox News website, it's going to pass. People are going to forget about it. Just like we've all forgotten about stories about those transgender bathrooms. Do you guys remember that? I don't know, it might not be relevant to your lives anymore. But here it is on the front page of HuffingtonPost.com. Supreme Court about to enter legal fight over trans rights and bathroom access. It will be the first time the High Court has squarely addressed these issues. Now this story was posted about a week ago, but I feel like this whole controversy started a long time ago. And I haven't really heard it talked about since then. It's kind of just faded into the background. Well, now I'm going to bring it back into the foreground. We're going to read this story again and talk about it afterwards. And maybe I can show you the contrast between old and new. Maybe I can exemplify how these stories just follow a news cycle where they come, they go... They are extremely important in the media, and then they fade away and are forgotten and not talked about again. So here it is. The controversy over the rights of transgender students and bathroom access at their local schools has reached the Supreme Court. The dispute arrived at the justice's doorstep on Wednesday in the form of an emergency application by the Gloucester County School Board in Virginia 
which was ordered by a federal judge to accommodate a trans high school student who is denied access to a bathroom that aligns with his gender identity. The long-running fight of Gavin Grimm with Gloucester School authorities came to a head in April when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit sided with him and ruled that federal anti-discrimination law includes protections for trans individuals. That ruling, which a judge enforced in late June, was a high-water mark for transgender rights because it gave controlling weight to the Obama administration's interpretation of Title IX, the law that bars federally funded schools from discriminating against students on account of race, sex, and other protected categories. So it does irritate me that the school is fighting with this trans student about which bathroom he she can use. I'm guessing Gavin, since he's a transgender, uh, is trying to identify as a she, and the school is not accepting her and telling her that she has to identify with the genitals she was born with, not the gender that she wants to be. So that is frustrating to me, because if you really decide that you want to be a different gender, there's not really anybody that can tell you you're not. I mean, sure, your body physically will disagree, but gender identity is more so about the gender you feel that you are, or the, what you express as far as sexual attraction goes. I mean, obviously I see why you wouldn't want men and women sharing a bathroom, because if a man goes into a woman's bathroom and sees, you know, oh, here's an opportunity for rape. <laughs> but it's not like I expect that's going to happen. I just think that women feel more comfortable exposing themselves and being vulnerable around other women people that they don't feel have any sexual attraction to them. But I don't see why the school is so concerned about which bathroom she uses. I mean, it's not like students don't sneak into the other sex bathroom anyway. I mean, I used to do that when I was younger. It was kind of a joke. But at the same time, it's a bathroom. You just go there to pee. I mean, sure, some students use it for other things, like just skipping class and sitting in there. I remember one time somebody smoked a cigarette in the bathroom and one of my friends got nabbed for it, even though it wasn't really her. I'm just saying, bathrooms are used for relaxing and relieving. So why can't this man who is a girl use the bathroom that she wants to? Also, I find it kind of uh, irritating that the legal system has to set precedent for protected categories such as race, sex, or gender identity because I think that it should just be common knowledge that you don't discriminate based on things that you can't really decide. I mean, it's not a choice to be black or white or Asian. It's not a choice to be male or female. It's not a choice to feel like you were born the wrong gender because sometimes people really are. It's a genetic thing. It's predetermined. There's Nothing you can do to change that. And because of that, there's no reason why you should be judged as a person based on things that you can't control. People should judge you based on your actions, on your character, what you say, what you do, not on what you are. All right, so back to the story. Congress didn't originally write the sex provision in the law to cover gender identity, but a number of appeals courts and the federal government have determined that it's also covered, prompting the Department of Education to issue guidance for states and localities to make arrangements for trans students or else risk losing federal funding. I don't think schools should have federal funding anyway. I think they should be funded by the people who choose to go there or choose not to, you know? Why don't you pay the school directly instead of paying the state and then the state paying the federal government and then the federal government paying the schools? It's just too many middlemen, you know? Why don't people have choice when it comes to schooling? Anyway, in turn, that same guidance has sparked a flurry of lawsuits by and against the federal government in North Carolina, Texas, and Nebraska, each raising related legal issues. 
Grimm's school district mentioned these recent developments in its petition to the Supreme Court to bolster its argument that the issue is of nationwide importance and thus merits intervention. You know, I do think this story is kind of important. I think that it's good that this message is getting out there, that some people are born one way, but they really are meant to be a different gender. It does happen, and I I believe it. And I've read stories about how sometimes uh, when children are born, the doctors take a look at their genitals and go, oh, that's not right. And then they clip and snip and sew up and... These children grow up not knowing that they're actually wrong in some way. But I'm just saying, I I think that many people have forgotten about this story. And it used to be a big deal. I mean, I remember when I was hearing jokes about it all the time. That and Ebola. Remember the Ebola epidemic? That is completely forgotten now, at least as far as I'm concerned. I was never really concerned with it when it was a new story anyway, because the chances of anyone getting Ebola are slim to none, unless you live in Africa where the outbreak actually occurred. But I'm guessing most of us do not. But you see how these stories come and they slowly fade away and then they disappear from our memories altogether? It's just this news cycle to create more clicks and more money for the corporations that push out this garbage. It's not really important or meaningful to us. It doesn't change our lives. It doesn't focus on the deeper importance or meaning that we are all looking for, that we all want to fulfill in our existence. One realm that kind of does touch on that subject, but I don't I don't think so fully is politics. And the reason I say that is because politics is the practice of how to control people. Usually it's based on a sort of philosophy. I mean, you can't have a philosophy about a group of individuals unless you have a philosophy on the individual level. That's where the difference in politics lies. Democrats versus Republicans versus Libertarians versus any other party you can think of. They all have a difference in their philosophy. I don't really talk about politics so much because there are more articulate people in the world that study politics, that actually pay attention to it and watch what's happening in the world and make it their living. It's their passion or their job. Uh, And that's not me. I do like philosophy a lot. I think philosophy is, is important. It's essential to existence, but I don't think that politics is. Because, like I said, it's the practice of how to control others, and it's kind of misinformed and narrow-minded. I mean, who says that we need to control other people anyway? What advancement has it really brought us? Perhaps you could say that during certain periods in history... The formation of a strong political party or ruling class has led to some sort of stability. But at what cost? What about the innocent people who perhaps are are just working class, they're poor, and then a bunch of these powerful people come in and say, okay, now you have to pay us money every month, otherwise we kill you or we take your land or we take your property and you're never going to see it again. You have to join the army, otherwise we're going to jail you. Things like that, they just, they're not just when you look at them on an individual level. But some people look at those actions and say, well, if we're considering everyone involved, then it's for the good of the majority, which is more important than the good of the individual, which is totally wrong and misled. After all, how can you care for other people if you don't care for yourself most of all. It is the individual that is of most importance, and politics completely blasts that idea out of the water. Politics is all about the majority, everything about it. And if you don't believe me, let's just look at some of the more popular forms of government in the world, or ones that have existed in the past. 
All right, so this list I have goes in alphabetical order. I'm going to skip over some of them and just go through the major ones. Absolute monarchy. A form of government where the monarch rules unhindered without any laws, constitution, or legally organized opposition. Anarchy. A condition of lawlessness or political disorder. Notice political disorder, not societal disorder brought about by the absence of governmental authority. Authoritarian, a form of government in which state authority is imposed onto many aspects of citizens' lives, kind of like it is now in the state that we live in. Commonwealth, a nation, state, or other political entity founded on law and united by a compact of the people for the common good. Communist, a system of government in which the state plans and controls the economy and a single, often authoritarian party holds power. State controls are imposed with the elimination of private ownership of property or capital while claiming to make progress towards a higher societal order in which all goods are equally shared by the people, otherwise known as a classless society. Confederacy, a union by compact or treaty between states, provinces, or territories that creates a central government with limited powers. The constituent entities retain supreme authority over all matters except those delegated to the central government. Constitutional, a government by or operating under an authoritative document that sets forth the system of fundamental laws and principles that determine the nature, functions, and limits of that government. Constitutional democracy, a form of government in which the sovereign power of the people is spelled out in a governing constitution. Constitutional monarchy, a system of government in which a monarch is guided by a constitution whereby his or her rights, duties, and responsibilities are spelled out in written law or by custom. Democracy, a form of government in which the supreme power is retained by by the people, but which is usually exercised indirectly through a system of representation and delegated authority periodically renewed. Democratic Republic, a state in which the supreme power rests in the body of citizens entitled to vote for officers and representatives responsible for them. Dictatorship, a form of government in which a ruler or small clique wield absolute power not restricted by constitutional laws, of course. Federal or Federation, a form of government in which sovereign power is formally divided, usually by means of a constitution, between a central authority and a number of constituent regions, so that each region retains some management of its internal affairs, differs from a confederacy in that the central government exerts influence directly upon both individuals as well as upon the regional units. Federal Republic, a state in which the powers of the central government are restricted and in which the component parts retain a degree of self-government, ultimate sovereign powers rest with the voters who choose their governmental representatives. Marxism, the political, economic, and social principles espoused by 19th century economist Karl Marx. He viewed the struggle of workers as a progression of historical forces that would proceed from a class struggle of the proletariat exploited by capitalists to a socialist dictatorship of the proletariat to, finally, a classless society, communism. Monarchy, a government in which the supreme power is lodged in the hands of a monarch who reigns over a state or territory, usually for life and by hereditary right. The monarch may be either a sole absolute ruler or a sovereign, such as a king, queen, or prince, with constitutionally limited authority. Oligarchy, a government in which control is exercised by a small group of individuals whose authority generally is based on wealth or power. Parliamentary democracy, a political system in which the legislature selects the government. A prime minister, premier, or chancellor, along with cabinet ministers, according to party strength as expressed in elections. By this system, the government acquires a dual responsibility, to the people as well as to the parliament. Presidential, a system of government where the executive branch exists separately from a legislature, to which it is generally not accountable. Republic, 
a representative democracy in which the people's elected deputies, not the people themselves, vote on legislation. Totalitarian, a government that seeks to subordinate the individual to the state by controlling not only all political and economic matters, but also the attitudes, values, and beliefs of its population. Now, there's something I want to point out that almost all of these systems have in common, but none of them state it because obviously they don't want you to know. But all of these systems of government share a weakness in common, and that weakness is that Humans love to have power and control. I think we all know the statement, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, obviously, you would think, well, not if we have a democracy where we vote on the people to represent us and our representatives vote on legislation, then it's pretty fair, right? Well, the thing is, first of all, no. That is majority rule. Second of all, everybody especially representatives, are vulnerable to being influenced by money or by other powerful people, some sort of incentive. It's quite easy to sway politicians into getting more power for themselves, because the only reason they are in politics is to gain power for themselves. Unless they're like Ron Paul, where he was just trying to get people back to common sense. Still, I think the realm of politics is the realm of how to control people and how to gain more power for yourself. Now, I don't really like any of these forms of government. The only person that I trust to make decisions for me is myself. I don't trust any sort of government, especially not one that is elected by the majority of the people, because obviously the majority of people don't really have a firm grasp on what they want for their lives, or how to get that, or how to control it. If you vote someone into power, don't you think that you have some sort of responsibility to keep them doing what you want them doing? And I don't see that happening in any part of the world now. I just see these ultra-powerful beings making laws, committing horrific crimes, and not being punished at all for it. Not as long as they have a majority of other powerful people on their side, anyway. I don't see how politics has really brought about anything beneficial except for more warring amongst ourselves, amongst people that we've never met. It makes us hate certain people while loving those that don't really deserve our respect. It really distorts our view of reality, and I, I think that people would be far better off if just left to their own devices. So, again, like I said earlier, I think most people in their life, they're searching for some sort of deeper meaning, something that will fulfill their potential, something that will improve their lives and the lives of those around them that they love. Now, news isn't going to do that. Politics isn't going to do that. What does? Well, ultimately, it comes down to you know, asking those questions of ourselves. What do we want? What is it that we have to offer? How can we make the most of this existence that we live in, this world that we live in? Well, there is one thing, and it's not actually just one thing. It's basically millions and millions of different options that it opens up. But it essentially comes down to studying nature that will bring us answers to our existence. And when I say nature, I don't just mean like the trees and the birds. I mean what exists naturally, including you. Because after all, you are part of nature. You arose naturally. Here you are, you're alive just like your dog and your cat, or the birds and the trees outside. You arose naturally. You have a nature to you as well. You've heard the saying, human nature. It's something that we all share in common because it's what we are. And studying that, trying to understand it, just sitting and thinking or asking yourself questions and learning about yourself and the things around you, that is what will bring answers to your existence, to those, those questions that you have. 
And those answers allow us to advance not only technology and the things that we have around us, but also our quality of life and what we spend our time doing. Hundreds of years ago, the majority of life was spent finding food and cooking it and then cleaning our, our living area. Now, today, we have mass production farms. We have food that can be found easily in grocery stores that are artificially lit. Our working hours aren't just limited to daylight now. We can work anytime, anywhere, especially thanks to the internet. And the internet allows us access to all knowledge that is out there. The possibilities now are endless. And it's all because people asked questions. How can I have light after the sun goes down? How can I create more food? How can I provide this food easily to others? How can I spend less time cleaning and cooking and spend more time doing the things I love? Finding answers to those questions has led us to the point that we're at today. But we can't stop. We can't just accept the world as it is around us. We have to keep going with these advancements. Because, let's be honest, not everybody is living a happy, fulfilled existence. And even if you are happy with your life, there's probably still some part of you that thinks, there's more. There's more out there that I want, that I know I can do. It is not only our right, but also our responsibility to ourselves to satisfy that curiosity and answer those big questions. The people who have helped humans out the most throughout history have been the dreamers. The people who ask the biggest questions and imagine the craziest scenarios or, or take on the, the biggest, most difficult challenges that nobody else has faced. Those dreamers, they follow their questions to answers. And those answers are, are what have brought us such wonderful things in life, such as this laptop that I'm staring at right now, or the understanding of space and time so that now we have satellites up in space that can track our movements and, and send us signals without delay. Those are incredible, amazing discoveries. Things that maybe sometimes we take for granted, but really when you think about it, it's just amazing the way that they were developed. Now these dreamers, they're fascinating people to me because they are, they're the ones that have brought about the most influential aspects of our culture. Things that we still talk about, they're timeless. They bring up more questions and more interest than anything else. They inspire me to be a better person. And not just me, I'm sure it's many people. These dreamers are so influential to me. I want to be one. I want to be one of these dreamers that comes up with some sort of crazy idea that everybody at first thinks, no, that's too weird, it's never gonna work. And then, eventually, somebody will find out that, hey, that crazy idea was actually right. And it brings about a world of change. Even if I can't be one, I still aspire to it, because I think it's the most noble thing you can do with your life. And even if it's not, it's still fun and interesting, and it keeps me curious about everything around me. It's why I talk about things like alien life. Eventually, maybe that fascination will lead to some sort of discovery, and maybe that discovery will lead to some sort of improvement for everyone around the world. Even if it's just one person that it helps, I would still feel very gratified. I think it's probably one of the greatest tragedies that many people who are geniuses or who are these crazy dreamers, seldom do they ever get to live long enough to experience their, their fame and all of the change that they've brought to people's lives throughout the years. Occasionally they do but sometimes they're too humble to really accept it or to see it. The love that I have for these people, the fascination that I feel when I look at their work, I have never been happier than when thinking about them. So I'm going to read this page titled 10 Dreams That Changed Human History because oftentimes these dreamers, they're called that not only because they have great imaginations, 
but also because sometimes things just come to them in dreams. Literally, that's where they get their ideas from. Dreams have been responsible for some major creative and scientific discoveries in the course of human history. They're no longer dismissed by psychologists as random neuron firings or meaningless fantasies. Dreams are now considered an ongoing thought process that just happens to occur while you're asleep. Here are 10 remarkable dreams of some of the world's most prominent scientists, writers, musicians, mathematicians, and inventors whose moments of dream insight went down on record. The world's first sci-fi novel written by Mary Shelley. In 1816, the story Frankenstein, often cited as the world's first science fiction novel, was inspired by a vivid nightmare. At just 18 years old, Shelley visited Lord Byron at Lake Geneva in Switzerland. They were locked in a cold volcanic winter caused by the eruption of Mount Tambora the year prior, creating Europe's year without a summer. Stuck indoors and huddled around a log fire, Byron suggested they each write a ghost story, but night after night, Shelley was unable to think of anything suitable. Then one evening, when discussion turned to the nature of life, Shelley suggested perhaps a corpse could be reanimated. Backed by the thought that galvanism had given token of such things. Galvanism was named after the scientist Luigi Galvani, who investigated the effect of electricity on dissected animals in the 1780s and 1790s. He usually did it with frogs or occasionally with dead human bodies. He would hook them up to a source of electricity, and then they would twitch and writhe. Some people were disgusted by this idea. They thought it was mortifying. And yet, this idea caught Mary Shelley's intrigue. It inspired a fantasy. Later that night, after turning in, her imagination took hold, and she experienced what she described as a vivid waking dream. This is a quote from Mary Shelley. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. That was the first seed that inspired her novel Frankenstein, which then inspired many other people to build off of her works. Frankenstein is still known today, hundreds of years later. People still fear the idea. All because of one girl's imagination. This also happened to Paul McCartney once upon a time. In 1965, Paul McCartney composed the entire melody for the hit acoustic song Yesterday in a Dream. It came back to him fully formed when he woke up, and he quickly replicated the song on his piano, asking his friends and family if they'd ever heard it before. He was initially worried because he might have been simply replicating someone else's work. Lennon and McCartney then wrote the melody in the song. However, McCartney said, For about a month, I went round to people in the music business and asked them whether they had ever heard it before. Eventually, it became like handing something into the police. I thought, if no one claimed it after a few weeks, then I could have it. Well, of course, he hadn't heard that song before. It was completely made up in his dream. It was released in America and stayed at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart for four weeks. It still remains massively popular today, with more than 2,200 cover versions by other artists. The structure of the atom was imagined once in the dream of Niels Bohr, which if you're into chemistry, Bohr is part of every curriculum. He was a wonderful genius. 
and to think that the structure of the atom came to him in a dream is quite surprising to me to be honest the father of quantum mechanics niels bohr often spoke of the inspirational dream that led to his discovery of the structure of the atom the most fundamental particle the son of academic parents bohr got his doctorate in nineteen eleven and gained notoriety for deciphering complex problems in the world of physics that had left his colleagues stumped in time he set upon understanding the structure of the atom but none of his configurations would fit one night he went to sleep and began dreaming about atoms he saw the nucleus of the atom with electrons spinning around it much as planets spin around the sun immediately on wakening bohr felt the vision was accurate but as a scientist he knew the importance of validating his idea before announcing it to the world smart men he returned to his lab and searched for evidence to support his theory it held true and bohr's vision of the atomic structure turned out to be one of the greatest breakthroughs of his day bohr was later awarded a nobel prize for physics as a result of his leap in creative thinking while asleep this next one is is pretty unsuspecting elias howe with the eye of the needle you would think wow that's such a simple simple thing the eye on the end of a needle obviously but i mean before 1845 i guess nobody had thought of it yet so in 1845 howe invented the sewing machine based on a famous dream that helped him to understand the mechanical penetration of the needle he was not the first to conceive the idea of a sewing machine however but howe made the significant refinement to the design and was awarded the first u s patent for a sewing machine using a lock stitch design according to family history records he almost beggared himself before he discovered where the eye of the needle of the sewing machine should be located he might have failed altogether if he had not dreamed he was building a sewing machine for a savage king in a strange country just as in his actual working experience he was perplexed about the needle's eye he thought the king gave him twenty-four hours in which to complete the machine and make it so if not finished in that time death was to be the punishment how worked and worked and puzzled and finally gave it up then he thought he was taken out to be executed he noticed that the warriors carried spears that were pierced near the head instantly came the solution of the difficulty and while the inventor was begging for time he awoke it was four o'clock in the morning he jumped out of bed ran to his workshop and by nine a needle with an eye at the point had been rudely modeled after that it was easy that is the true story of an important incident in the invention of the sewing machine apparently before that time people had tried putting the end at the bottom of the needle or in the middle none of them really seemed to work nobody could figure out why but the eye at the top that's where it is albert einstein we all know his name he was one of the most famous physicists of all time but once he had a dream about the speed of light einstein is famous for his genius insights into the nature of the universe but what about his dreams as it happens he came to the extraordinary scientific achievement discovering the principle of relativity after having a vivid dream as a young man einstein dreamed he was sledding down a steep mountainside going so fast that eventually he approached the speed of light at this moment the stars in his dream changed their appearance in relation to him he awoke and meditated on this idea soon formulating what would become one of the most famous scientific theories in the history of mankind einstein's dreams which is a book by alan lightman is now a modern classic a fictional collage of stories dreamed by albert einstein in 1905 on the brink of his breakthrough discoveries in one time is circular so that people are fated to repeat their triumphs and failures over and over in another time stands still where lovers cling together in eternity 
in another yet, time is a nightingale, trapped by a bell jar. These all sound like interesting dreams. Although I think anybody else who would who would have had that dream about sledding down a hill and then seeing the stars change in relation to them, they would have taken it at face value. I don't think anybody but Albert Einstein would have seen from that the theory of relativity. That is where his genius came from, not just his dream. Although, as I said in the beginning of this article, dreams are not just thoughts that flit in and out and we have no control over them. They're actually thought processes that occur without our conscious mind controlling them. This next dream is from The Man Who Knew Infinity, Srinivasa Ramanujan. The mathematical genius made substantial contributions to analytical theory of numbers, elliptical functions, continued fractions, and infinite series, and proved more than 3,000 mathematical theorems in his lifetime. Being a student of calculus right now, I can tell you that that is no small feat. Even just proving one for me is very difficult. Ramanujan stated that the insight for his work came to him in his dreams on many occasions. Ramanujan said that throughout his lifetime, he repeatedly dreamed of a Hindu goddess known as Namakal. She presented him with complex mathematical formulas over and over, which he could then test and verify upon awakening. One such example was the infinite series for pi. Describing one of his many insightful math dreams, Ramanujan said, While asleep, I had an unusual experience. There was a red screen formed by flowing blood, as it were. I was observing it. Suddenly, a hand began to write on the screen. I became all attention. That hand wrote a number of results in elliptical integrals. They stuck to my mind. As soon as I woke up, I committed them to writing. There is a fascinating story behind the prolific dreamer. Learn more about the life of Ramanujan, a self-taught math prodigy from India, and how he formed his brilliant theories. From the temples and slums of Madras to the courts and chapels of Cambridge University, it's an unlikely story that saw Ramanujan rise from underprivileged obscurity to one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century. This next dreamer's name is Robert Louis Stevenson. A fine bogey tale. In 1886, Stevenson dreamed up three key sequences from the infamous fantasy thriller novel The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A sick man for most of his life, he wrote mainly to support his family. Until, that was, it came to the inception of Jekyll and Hyde. Stevenson said, For two days I went about racking my brains for a plot of any sort. And on the second night I dreamed the scene at the window, and a scene afterwards split in two, in which Hyde, pursued for some crime, took the powder and underwent the change in the presence of his pursuers. While recovering in bed from a hemorrhage, Fanny Stevenson heard his screams resulting from an opium-induced nightmare. He promptly awoke and complained, Why did you wake me? I was dreaming a fine bogey tale. Fanny later discovered that she had woken him at the first transformation scene. The next morning... Stevenson began scribbling furiously, and three days later he had written a 30,000-word draft. But when Fanny noted it was an allegory, contrary to his original intent, he threw it on the fire and started over. For a further three days his family tiptoed around him while he sat in bed, writing, surrounded by torn-up pages, until at last the final draft was ready. In all, he wrote 64,000 words in six days. Some kind of miracle in his time, without typewriters or computer power to speak of. His stepson, Lloyd Osborne, wrote of this amazing feat. I don't believe that there was ever such a literary feat before as the writing of Dr. Jekyll. I remember the first disease of the world, though it were yesterday. Lois came downstairs in a fever. 
read nearly half the book aloud, and then, while we were still gasping, he was away again and busy writing. I doubt if the first draft took so long as three days. The success of his book was phenomenal. To this day, the phrase Jekyll and Hyde is part of our language, an idiom referencing someone who has dual personalities and swings between good and evil behavior. The story has also inspired modern-day spin-offs, such as Bradley Cooper in Limitless, in which a would-be writer is transformed into a perfect version of himself. This next dream comes to you from Otto Louis, Nerve Impulse Breakthrough. Otto Louis was a German-born pharmacologist whose discovery of acetylcholine, ironically, a neurotransmitter which promotes dreaming, helped advance medical therapy. The discovery earned him a Nobel Prize 13 years later. However, he is almost as famous for the means by which he discovered it as he is for the discovery itself. In 1921, Louis dreamed of an experiment that would prove once and for all that transmission of nerve impulses was chemical, not electrical. He woke up, scribbled the experiment down, and went back to sleep. The next morning, he arose excitedly to try his experiment, but was horrified to find he couldn't read his midnight ramblings. That day, he said, was the longest day of his life, as he tried but failed to recall his dream. The following night, however, he had the same dream repeat itself, and upon wakening, went directly to his lab to prove the Nobel Prize-winning theory of chemical transmission of the nervous impulse. Oh my gosh, that would be horrible if you had a dream that was so wonderful it solved a problem and then you forgot it. Or worse yet, you wrote it down and you couldn't read what you wrote. This next dream I've actually heard about before in my early days as a chemistry student. It comes from August Kekule and it's called the Ouroboros Benzene Dream. A prominent German organic chemist... August Kekule insightfully dreamed of the structure of the benzene molecule, which, unlike other known organic compounds, had a circular structure rather than a linear one. But nobody knew that at the time. This new understanding of all aromatic compounds proved to be so important for both pure and applied chemistry after 1865 that the German Chemical Society organized an elaborate appreciation in Kekule's honor where he described the dream that inspired the breakthrough. He said he discovered the ring shape of the benzene molecule after having a reverie of a snake seizing its own tail, a common ancient symbol known as the Ouroboros. I was sitting writing at my textbook, but the work did not progress. My thoughts were elsewhere, so I turned my chair to the fire and dozed. Again, the atoms were gamboling before my eyes. This time, the smaller groups kept modestly in the background. My mental eye, rendered more acute by the repeated visions of this kind, could now distinguish larger structures of manifold conformation. Long rows, sometimes more closely fitted together, all twining and twisting in snake-like motion. But look! What was that? One of the snakes had seized hold of its own tail, and the form whirled mockingly before my eyes. As if by a flash of lightning I awoke, and this time also I spent the rest of the night in working out the rest of the hypothesis. So it turned out just from that vision of a snake eating itself, they found the form of benzene without even chemically testing it. That's pretty amazing. The last and final dream I'm going to be reading to you comes from Frederick Banting about advances in medicine. After his mother passed away from diabetes, Frederick Banting was motivated to find a cure. Eventually, he found the next best thing, a treatment using insulin injections, which, though not a true cure, could at least significantly extend the lifespan of sufferers. The discovery won him a Nobel Prize in medicine at just 32 years old. 
Although he lacked knowledge of diabetes and clinical research, his unique knowledge of surgery, combined with his assistant's knowledge of diabetes, made the ideal research team. While seeking to isolate the exact cause of diabetes, Banting had a dream telling him to surgically ligate or tie up the pancreas of a diabetic dog in order to stop the flow of nourishment. He did, and discovered a disproportionate balance between sugar and insulin. This breakthrough led to another dream that revealed how to develop insulin as a drug to treat the condition. Banting was named Canada's first professor of medical research, and by 1923, he was the most famous man in the country. He received letters and gifts of, of adoration from hundreds of grateful diabetics all over the world, and since then, insulin has saved or transformed the lives of millions of people. Have you ever had a profound dream that impacted your waking life? I know I have. And they're not always good. They're not always bad. I don't always remember them. I try to keep a dream journal, but honestly, sometimes dreams are just pleasant fantasies. Sometimes they are life-changing, like the ones I just read to you. But I find those are the exception rather than the rule. One thing I can say, though, is that sometimes you don't need to be asleep in order to dream. Sometimes daydreams are the best way to dream because then you can actually guide what you're envisioning. But you have to be relaxed enough not to completely control what's going on. Let your mind unfold before you. Let it show you the things that you already know to be true. You just need to bring them to the forefront of your mind, to your conscious mind. Your subconscious holds all sorts of secrets and answers that your conscious mind would love to know. And when I speak of being inspired by dreamers, I don't always mean people who just have crazy dreams and then make a discovery from that. Sometimes I just mean people who like to dream in their own world. Or imaginative people who take what they know and they learn from it. They put it together in new and different ways. That's all a dreamer is. And perhaps that's why I talk about these dreams crazy fantastical ideas it's just because I like to explore these ideas and see what we can learn from them and if that's you I hope you enjoy taking these journeys with me every week into the realm of the unknown into the realm of what can we learn of exploring curiosity and trying perhaps to find some semblance of truth in this crazy crazy world I think that about wraps it up for this week. So thank you again, everyone, for listening to the Illumination Hour with me, your host, Ellen Stallone. Come back again next week. Send me an email at illuminationhour at gmail.com, and I will respond to you. Dream away, folks, and have a good week. 